let's just recap this for a moment, right? Just a reality check here. The countries of the world that have the most stable economies and that suffer from the smallest boom and bust cycles are the countries with the highest tax rates on the very, very wealthy. The reason for that is that the government is functioning essentially as a stabilizer. So, you know, uh, capitalist economies, there's just a, a fundamental truth about them. This is not a knock on capitalism. It's just the way it is. Capitalist economies go in cycles of boom and bust. There are big cycles, the, what's referred to as the 80-year cycle, um, you know, of major boom and bust. And then there are smaller cycles, what's sometimes referred to as the, you know, 8 to 10-year cycle of, uh, you know, recession. Every, every roughly 8 to 10 years, there's a consequential recession. And so when those depressions or recessions happen, a government that is well-funded, in other words, it has a broad enough and high enough tax base that the government has resources, that government can spend money into the recession. They can build new roads, they can do you know, new construction projects, they can build new sewer systems, they can build out you know, high-speed internet infrastructure, whatever it may be, that, that government can spend, or for that matter, they can, you know, like in an extreme case, like in the Great Depression, uh, the, the Republican Great Depression, what uh, Franklin Roosevelt did was he even, you know, hired people to do basically scut work, you know, to, 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 to plant trees, to, to, uh, to sweep streets, literally. Uh, the WPA was hiring people to paint murals, hired poets to, read, to write poetry and do public readings. I mean, and not that that's scut work, but it's not the kind of thing that traditionally you think of as government functions. The reason our government was doing that was because capitalism was in one of its cyclical failures, one of its cyclical crash modes. And government at that point needs to step in and stimulate the economy by putting as much money as possible at the bottom of the economy into the pockets of working people, um, which is exactly what FDR did. And it's how we got out of the Great Depression and between that and World War II, which was the largest government stimulus in the history of the United States. Wars are stimulative. It's not a good way to stimulate the economy because it's not long term. If you build a hospital, it stimulates the economy and continues for the next, you know, 50 years as a great, you know, revenue source and healing source. You build a bomb and, you know, it might cost the same as the hospital, but once you drop that bomb, it's gone. The money is gone and the bomb is gone. So, so anyhow, the, the, these cycles of boom and bust are best handled by by nations like you know the, the nations of you know Scandinavian countries, the Northern European countries, Germany during the, the great crash of 2007, 2008, or 2008, 2009. I mean, the, it, one of the biggest institutions in Germany that got hit was Deutsche Bank, but it was mostly because they were loaning into the and they were playing and they were gambling on American derivatives in the American housing market. But my point is that those high tax rates, and we haven't seen high tax rates since the 1980s. I'm talking about over 50% on income over $3 million a year, which is what we had in 1920. It's what we had in 1940, 1950, 1960, 1970, and 1980, and we no longer had after 1982. Top tax rates over 50% stabilize the economy. They reduce the impact of recessions. And sure enough, in 1921, Warren Harding ran on a campaign of dropping the top tax rate on the richest in America from 91% down to 25%. He won the election, and he dropped the top tax rate. And what did it do? It started a bubble. It kicked off what, was, what we refer to as the Roaring Twenties, which was pure bubble, fueled by rich people. It was a, a speculative stock and real estate bubble. And that bubble burst, it started bursting in Florida in, the, in, in early 1928. And by, by the end of 1929, that property bubble had reached all the way to New York City and, and it took down the stock market too. And it was all fueled by the tax cut of, 2000, of, of 1921. So we saw that happening. And for the next 30 years, literally for the next 30 years, arguably the next 40 years, no Republican was stupid enough to say, we need to do what Harding did. 
let's create another Great Depression until Reagan came along. And Reagan passed two big tax cuts in, in 82 and 86. The, the first one dropped the top tax rate from 74% to 50%. The second one dropped it from 50% down to 25%. And those two tax cuts then led to, in 1987, the biggest crash in the history of the stock market with the single exception of 1929. Now, that crash didn't last more than you know, a few days, the, the really severe part of it, and the consequences of it. It was about a year-long you know, pain. But it wasn't just the crash. The other thing that happened was that the growth of the middle class, the bottom 60% of Americans in terms of wages and wealth, the growth of the middle class, which had been faster in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s than any time in the history of America, the growth of the middle class, which was growing faster than the wealthiest 10%, the wealthiest 20%, even though it, the, the bottom 60% was growing in wealth and income faster in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and, eight, and uh, up until the 1980s, was growing faster than the, than the top 40%. And this is no secret. Any economist can tell you this. High tax rates, high economic growth. Low tax rates, what happens? The, 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 the country encounters a, a, a rough patch. And what do we do? We, we, have to, we have to stimulate the economy with debt. So now we're $20 trillion in debt. So you had the, the big tax cut of 21 led to the crash of 29. The big tax cuts of 81 and 86 led to the great crash of 87. The big cut of 2002, George W. Bush's, led to the crash of 2007. Another bubble economy. It was a real estate bubble, just like the one in the Roaring Twenties. And so now we get a giant cut, tax cut in 2017. What's next? I'd say another crash. It just seems like, you know, this is, this is what Republicans do. They suck up as much money as they can for themselves and the donors who own them, the wealthy class, you know, the, the, the top 1%, the top 1,000th of 1%. Republicans take as much money out of the economy as they can to give to those people, the morbidly rich. And then, and then the morbidly rich direct their media empires to tell us that that stuff falling on our heads is actually rain. It's a golden shower, yes. Trickle, it's trickling down on us. And we know that we're just peons, right? So this is, you know, so they're playing this game again, right? The Republicans, they played this game in 29, or in, in 21. It led to 29, it led to a disaster. They played this game in 1980, and it led to a disaster. They played this, and, 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 it, and it flattened the wages of working people for literally 35 years to this day. And then they played this game when George W. Bush came in, and it led to a disaster 2008, 2009. They're doing it again. What did Einstein say? The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. There is going to be a reckoning. The question, the political question, I mean, you know, economically, you can ask any rational economist, there will be a reckoning. But the qu political question is, who's going to take the blame? And there is a theory suggesting that the, what the Republicans are doing is they're setting up the next crash in anticipation of the Democrats having political power when the crash happens, and so that they can blame the whole thing on the Democrats. They can say, see, you know, because if the crash happens right after the 2018 election, or in 2019, or right after the 2020 election, and frankly, I don't think it's going to take that long, but if the crash happens after that, and Democrats have seized power, the Republicans are going to be saying, see, look at what the Democrats did to you. We'll see how that works out, but I'm just giving you advance warning.